Good morning again, church family. My name is Davey Gibson. I'm the education and discipleship pastor here at Sugarland Baptist Church. We have a few people in the sanctuary with us for our pastor's class today, and we are excited at 3 p.m. on this live stream to share our Sugarland Christmas celebration, a Sugarland um, Pray for Peace, Live for Hope. I think I said that right. <laughs> it's at 3 p.m. and you don't want to miss it. And we are very blessed to be able to have Laura Story, a longtime Christian composer and uh, songwriter and an artist here with us to lead us in worship. I have been worshiping, as Pastor Taylor said, and uh, coming from um, student ministry years ago, we've been singing songs like Mighty to Save and Indescribable for many, many years. And they are the, the voice of, <clears throat> they give voice to our praise in worship on such a regular basis. And then most recently, her song, A Blessings, which we can hear on Christian radio um, regularly around our area. And so please um, make sure you, you grab a, a quick bite to eat, and then you tune back in on this live stream at 3 p.m. for our our Sugarland Christmas time together as our choir, our orchestra, our ballet grace as we share this wonderful, um, uh, uh, the sights and the sounds of the season uh, with you. And so we are blessed for that. We are, um, we have finished with our series, uh, Living in the Spirit. And there were two weeks that um, we had at the end of this year before we take off the week of December 27th that we decided that we would share two Christmas lessons together. And so this morning we're going to be in Matthew chapter 1 and we're going to start in verse 18. So if you were just on for Pastor Taylor's message, we're going back. We're going back one chapter to to the, um, Pastor Taylor was in Matthew 2. We're going to be in Matthew 1. Last week, Pastor Taylor covered the first 17 verses of Matthew 1. We're going to cover the last verses of Matthew 1. Matthew 1, 18 to 25, if you have a Bible. Well, there are many things that are impossible today that we wish we could do. Um, There are lots of things that we really wish we could be a part of today. Travel is one thing that we wish we could be a part of that we just can't do. Being around family and friends without having to pull the mask up or stay distant is just not a, a good idea when we are living in a time of a pandemic. This past week, I had the blessing of going and getting to see my mother. She lives in a nursing home in the San Antonio area. And I got to go see her because I had had a negative COVID test. And so normally no one would care if you got to go in and visit with your loved one in a hospital or nursing home setting. But now you almost have to prove that you are not a transmitter of the virus to get to go in and see her. There are lots of things that are negative. uh, There are lots of things that are impossible for us to do these days. Um, There are a few silly stories stories or phrases we've heard over the years. And so I've got some people in the room and I'm going to put them on the spot if that's okay. I'm going to ask them, what's something that you have been told over the years it's impossible to do? I'll give you an example. Like, have you ever tried to sneeze with your eyes open? Can you do that? Can't do that. You can't sneeze. It just, it just doesn't work. Your eyes closed. What's something else that is impossible to do? Anyone ever buttered some toast and dropped it on the floor? What always happens? Butter side down. It's impossible for it to land butter side up. Just to work. Anyone ever seen a cat fall and not land on its feet? Now, I haven't done a lot of tests with this, and I thought about trying to find someone that had a cat to bring it in the sanctuary. We could drop it off. No, we weren't going to do that. Um, But cats always land on their feet. It's impossible. They, They have that amazing ability. I've been told it's impossible for you to kiss your elbow or to lick your elbow. You just, you just can't do it. I would say it's impossible to not love your children or your grandchildren. Even when things don't happen the way we want them to, we always have love for for family members like that. I was also told one time, if you get five Baptists in a room, it's impossible to have any consensus of opinion. That might be true as well. We've got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of us in a room, so that's probably about eight opinions here. Well, we all know that there's some things in this world that seem completely impossible. Our story this morning, when we start to look at the birth of Jesus, the story Matthew tells is almost a complete and total impossibility in our scientific minds. I taught this lesson at 8.30 for one of our young adult classes, and one of the things we talked about was, do you ever think God was anxiously awaiting the sending of Jesus, the coming of the Messiah? We are so excited to 
anticipate Christmas. We got a lot of our presents wrapped this week, and the tree is up. And so Jack, my seven-year-old, wants to know how many days until Christmas, even though he has like three or four Advent calendars all over the house, he still wants to come up to us anytime. How many days? When can I open my present? Can I open one early? When do I get to open my present? We have a wreath here, an Advent wreath that helps us Remember the important time of Advent as we remember the the peace and the love and the hope and the joy that this season brings. And this Advent wreath is kind of a countdown. It hit me as we lit the pink candle this morning, this, this beautiful pink candle. I hope you can see it here up on the screen. That this candle is the joy candle. It's the only pink one on the wreath. And the joy candle reminds us we are on our third Sunday of Advent. Christmas is coming. I wondered if God had an anticipation when Jesus would come, when he would do this miraculous work we're going to read about in just a moment, this impossible task of having a child born of a virgin. Was God just as excited as we get at Christmas? Well, if you have your Bible, I invite you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 all the way down to 25. Matthew 1, 18 to 25. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home to be your wife, for what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give her the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet prophet Isaiah. The virgin will be with child and give birth to a son in which they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took Mary home as his wife, but he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son and he gave him the name Jesus. As we unpack these words. Let's pause for just a second and ask God to bless our time with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for these words and thank you for this amazing story. We pray that it speaks to our hearts again. Use this time, whether we are studying your word in this room or online, use it that we may be more in tune with who you are and who you called us to be. We thank you for the joy that this season brings because of Jesus and all that he did on our behalf. And it's in his name we pray, amen. Well, when we start to unpack what's happening here, Matthew gives us a very unique perspective. I find it very interesting that in this first chapter of the New Testament, there is one character that's strangely absent from really doing anything in this story. Pastor Taylor alluded to it in his message when he talked about how we don't have our shepherds and our sheep and our manger and Bethlehem. We don't have all of those things in this birth of Jesus story. Matthew gets right to the point. He wants us to know how Jesus came into the world, why Jesus came into the world, and the meaning behind his name, that there was a miracle behind how Jesus came into the world. There's a miracle on why Jesus came into the world, and there is a miraculous thing that's happening as Jesus is given his name. Matthew is a good Jew, and he's writing to a very Jewish audience. When you look throughout his his gospel, he brings in a lot of Jewish prophecy that other gospel writers don't bring in, but he is showing Jesus to be a Jewish Messiah, but one for the entire world as well. And so as a good Jew, Matthew really would have no reason to invent any kind of story about an immaculate conception or about Jesus not having a normal birth. He lists all of Jesus' ancestors. Pastor Taylor read them last week as we went through those first 17 chapters of Matthew. He fast forwards through the entire Old Testament in 17 chapters. I mean, that is a Cliff Notes version right there. 17 17 verses, and he's able to go through all the 39 books of the Old Testament. 
every one of those individuals came about in the normal way. There was nothing miraculous about how they came into being. Now, there were some good Jews on that list. There were some not so good Jews on that list. And there were some that weren't even Jewish at all. And so as Matthew's writing from this very Jewish perspective from the very beginning, he would have been aware that in ancient antiquity, the Greek and the Roman writers would have stories about the gods having relationships with humanity. These were pagan stories. Matthew would be aware about this. And so there's no sense in Matthew actually making up a story about this happening with Jesus. No, as N.T. Wright, our modern-day New Testament scholar, writes, Matthew really believes what he is writing, and so we can too. He has no benefit to make up a story about how Jesus would come into the world. It's not going to make his book a bestseller because the Jews wouldn't want to hear about this because it's a very pagan concept, except that what has happened here is an extraordinary event. And it it presents a good Jew like Joseph with the greatest decision of his life. I love how when we were looking at our lesson this week that it focuses on Matthew's description of Joseph as a righteous man or a just man. And so as I started researching more about this marriage arrangement between Mary and Joseph, I discovered a little bit of ancient Jewish wedding cultures. Weddings are a big deal in our society. They might have even been a bigger deal 2,000 years ago for Mary and Joseph. And so the wedding would take place in two steps over the course of a year. First, there would be an arrangement. Most marriages were arranged back then. And so as a young woman became of marriageable age, her father would then start to broker a deal with the father of the groom. And it would take some time for this deal to be brokered, but ultimately there would be a signed contract between the families. And at that moment... The two would become husband and wife. Note, when we start to look at this story again, we read that they were betrothed, they were engaged, they were pledged to be married. But then it says, but Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man in verse 19. The gospel writer even calls her husband. So the moment the contract was signed, they were husband and wife. But in Galilee of that time, where Nazareth is, that region, it was customary for them to have a year-long engagement where they would not live together. It was the year-long engagement period while the husband would either plan to add on a room to his parents' home so he and his wife could be there and start their family, or he would build a separate home if he had the means to do so. So there was a year of preparation, and after the year, there would be a giant feast wedding celebration where where they would launch their new lives together. So Mary and Joseph are in an engagement that is a whole lot more uh, a whole lot, uh, it's, it's a whole lot more serious than just what we would have today, like clicking a relationship status on Facebook or having an engagement as an oral agreement where no contract or marriage license had been signed. As soon as they got engaged, they signed the license. And it was done in front of witnesses. It was a public engagement, which means something major has happened now to this young couple. Mary's pregnant. And Joseph knows one thing, he's not the dad. So something has gone wrong and Joseph is now faced with a major situation. Only by divorce can these contracts be null or void or broken. And so Joseph has the option, based on Levitical law, though it was not practiced much at this time, and as we look at archaeological evidence, that he could have had Mary condemned to death. Breaking these covenants was a capital offense in Levitical and Deuteronomic law. But Joseph, as we read here, is a righteous man and does not want to expose her to public disgrace. So after this excitement, all that Joseph had dreamed about, starting his carpentry practice, building a room on his parents' house, being able to build a house for Mary one day, having the Davidic line continue through them. Because let's be honest, that's their job as being part of the line of David is to continue the Davidic line because one day there's going to be a Davidic king again. All of Mary's parents' dreams, having their daughter 
having everything set out perfectly for her to not only find a husband, but one from the Davidic line. And I don't imagine there were a lot of people in the Davidic line in that little town of Nazareth. In fact, one of the phrases around that time was, can anything good come from Nazareth? Think of the little towns you might have driven through back when you could take road trips and you had to pull over. Nazareth in Texas terms didn't even have a blinking light, a water tower, or a dairy queen. Small town. The phrase, can anything good come out of this? But it did because Mary's family had gotten her ready to be married to Joseph, a righteous son of David. But now everything has gone wrong. Well, I imagine Joseph, as he approached this major decision, recognizing life had changed entirely for both of them at the moment Mary came to, her, came to him and announced and told him what had happened. He prayerfully and decided as a good Jew he would take the path of least embarrassment. Why disgrace Mary any further? We know what has happened, and why should I, he risk his good name? Because if it wasn't, there wasn't long before people would start talking the fact that Joseph is wrestling with this decision shows that he was, as our lesson put it this week, a reluctant participant in God's plan. But can you blame him? When it comes to miracles, how quick are we to believe? I've often wondered why God brought his son into the world at this time. Why 2,000 years ago? Didn't God know that in 2,000 years we would have ERs and NICUs and places where we could have professional births, where doctors and nurses, people were skilled to take care of the, the infants, those that needed extra care? Why did God bring his son into the world at this time? Maybe God couldn't wait any longer. Maybe they were more ready than we are today. But, the, but Paul writes in Galatians 4.4, 4, But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, under the law, to redeem those under the law, so that we might receive the full rights as sons of God. So here we have God sending his son Jesus at just the right time. Well, maybe... When it comes to this miraculous thing, Joseph didn't really get fully on board. But once he saw the vision of the angel in the dream, he did exactly what God told him to. He took Mary home and protected her as his wife. He continued to be faithful to her, and he named his son. And by naming Jesus, he adopted Jesus into his line and so Jesus then becomes the son of David. We'll look at that more here in just a minute. But the last thing that Matthew tells us, he tells us the how Jesus came into the world. He tells us the why to save people from their sins. And he also gives us these two beautiful names, Jesus and Emmanuel. What does your name mean? Anyone know what their name means? Anybody in here know what their name means? What is it? Holler real loud so I can hear. It means strong? Awesome, awesome. When we find out what our name means, it's kind of cool. I remember learning as a child that my, my name, David, means God's beloved. It means God's beloved. I also then learned further on as I studied the Bible that Dalit Vav Dalit, David in Hebrew, is also the consonants for the number 14. And when you back up to Matthew 1.17, this is completely off the rails here for just a second, it reads, there are 14 generations from Abraham to David, 14 generations from David in the exile, and 14 generations from the exile to Christ. Dalit Vav Dalit, the son of David. God's beloved. My little brother's name is John. His name means God is gracious. It's fun to come up with what our names mean. I've seen little cards, greeting cards, little posters where you can put up in your kid's room and you can talk about what their names mean. But names meant a great deal to a mostly illiterate culture of this time. I mean, think back to Hosea, the prophet. Remember all the crazy names he gave his children like, you're no longer my people. You're no longer loved. I'm going to judge you. I mean, these were the names that his children carried with them. They were walking prophecies for what God was going to do. Every time Gomer or Hosea called his children in, they basically said, no longer loved, come here. Come here, no longer loved. It's time to come in. I mean, it was a constant reminder. 
Well, names mean so much to this culture. And so the name Jesus is the Greek form of Joshua in Hebrew. Yeshua, Yahweh saves. Every time Mary called her firstborn son by name Yeshua, she was reminded that it was Yahweh that was going to save them. This is a very popular name back then for that meaning. But it's so much more here because God has sent his son. And so Joseph's obedience allows Jesus to be adopted as a true son of David. It's Mary's role that allows Jesus to be born the son of God. Both now willing participants in what God is doing, this amazing plan. Joseph gives his new son, his adoptive son, the name Jesus. When we think of that name Joshua, what did Joshua do for the Israelites? When we think back, we have to go all the way back to Exodus. That's where we read about Joshua. And remember, Moses had led them all over the wandering of the wilderness for 40 years, and now Moses passes away, and there needs to be a new leader, and that's where we read about Joshua stepping in. So just like Paul will call Jesus the second Adam, the firstborn among many brothers, all of us good Gentiles in here and watching online, we are caught into God's forever family of Israelites because of Jesus, the new Adam. We really have Jesus as a new Joshua too, one that will lead his people into the promised land. And that's exactly what Joshua does in the Old Testament and what the new Yeshua, Jesus, does in the New Testament N.T. Wright, that I read earlier, continues, and he puts these words together. He, meaning Jesus, will rescue his people not from slavery in Egypt, but from the slavery of sin, the exile that they have suffered, not just in Babylon, but in their own hearts and lives. This new Joshua will lead us out of our exile into God's kingdom and away from our sin. I also took note that when we looked at our lesson, they focused in on the word Emmanuel as a kingly title, a title or name that would foreshadow what Jesus would say at the end of the book. Remember at that very end in Matthew 28, 20, he says, go now and preach the gospel to all, baptize in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then he gives this promise, I will be with you always. So at the first of the book, in Matthew 1, his name is Emmanuel. And in Matthew 28, he is still Emmanuel, God with us always. One of the biggest challenges when it comes to the Christmas story for a pastor is sometimes feeling like you need to reinvent the wheel each year. It's the same challenge with Easter too, is we've heard the story, we've told the story, we remind our children of the story, our grandchildren of the story, and sometimes we feel like we need to reinvent the wheel each week or each time it comes around, each year. And yet, I think it's important to remember that this, this is God. The story doesn't need to have anything else added to it other than just to be told again that this is God and this is Jesus who still comes to us today when human possibilities have run out. And this is the year 2020, folks. A lot of possibilities have run out, haven't they? There is a lot of things about this year we would rather not have to deal with. There's a lot of things that have been taken from us, or we might have felt like we have been denied. So when human possibility runs out, where do we turn? We turn to a God who's offering a new and startling way forward, who's always fulfilling his promises, and he does so by his powerful love and grace. What a gift, friends. What a promise fulfilled. What a reason to celebrate this Christmas season. Thank you for going through this story with us today. Thank you for telling your friends and family members about it this Christmas season. Thank you for embodying what God has called each and every one of us to be. His people with his spirit living out us. The same spirit that could do the impossible in Mary wants to do the impossible in our lives. And maybe one of those impossible things is just allowing us the opportunity to share him with our family or share him with a neighbor and see his saving power is still at work today, just like it has been for over 2,000 years. What impossible does God want to show us this week? Mary was open to it. We'll look at her story next week. Joseph was open to it. 
And even though he was an unwilling participant at first, he was a participant and he became a willing participant and became one that imparted an incredible prophetic fulfillment to Jesus being the son of David by adopting him into his family. God wants to do the impossible. May we have eyes to see it. May we be on the lookout for how God is going to work in us this week. Thank you for being in here, both in person and online. I'd like to conclu- conclude with the word of prayer. Next week, we have a very special treat. Don Johnson, one of our ABF leaders, is going to be leading us again with a Christmas lesson that he wrote several years ago. It's a beautiful lesson that he's shared with us as a pastoral staff, and we just said, hey, we'd love to have him share it as a, as a church. So you'll be blessed next week as Don is back here sharing with us again our Christmas lesson next week. We will take off on the 27th. There will not be Bible study on the 27th, just worship online and in person at 945 in this room. And then we start our Philippian study on January the 3rd. There are books here at the building. You can shoot me an email. I'll send you a book or drop one off at your house. Or you can come by any time during regular business hours and pick up a book. Let's pray together and we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you. Thank you for those faithfully in this room studying your word. Father, thank you for a word that speaks truthfully in our lives. A word that even though it may not make sense in our scientific minds, we know you weren't miracles. We, we sit here today as a miracle people saved by your grace, a grace that we did not deserve, a salvation that we could not earn, but a gift that you freely gave because you've done everything on our behalf so that we might have a relationship with you, that we might seek you in prayer. So God, forgive us when we take that for granted. Forgive us when we get caught up with all the negative that's happening around us. And let us be reminded that you are a God that does the impossible, that you are a God that works in and through us. Father, thank you for the greatest miracle of all. Thank you for Jesus. And we celebrate that gift this time of year, each year. But Lord, let us know your truth and your grace even more so now as we go through difficult days, as we struggle with family members that may be ill or worried about a virus, or worried about the uncertainty that comes from all that's happened in our world right now. God, let us know that you are still on your throne and that you do your greatest work when we will step back and be attentive and watch and be participants in your story. Thank you for calling us to that story. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, friends. Merry Christmas. Have a very blessed week.